Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. We're continuing in the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus this week. And uh, there's some exciting things that we've been learning. First off, we learned that Leviticus isn't just about rules and regulations for the Levites. That's, I, th I think, the most important thing we need to learn about this book, is that uh, it, it, it contains that, but the emphasis is approaching Yahweh. The emphasis of this book is you are to be a holy people because he is holy. See, it doesn't say you are becoming holy. It says you be holy because I am holy. So as we go through this book, we need to see what it means to be holy. What has Yahweh said we are? And then it's up to us to walk in ways that keep us that way. You know, you can't make yourself holy, but you can bring defilement. See, it's Yahweh that makes holy. So what does he consider holy? How does he consider we should live our lives? All of these things are relevant beyond just the Levites, beyond just Aaron and his sons. Okay, so we've got a few things to get into today. Uh, this parsha is Tzav, command. And uh, again, why do we learn the things that are relevant to Aaron and his sons and the Levites? Because we need to know the process. We need to know what their responsibilities were. And we use terminology even like this, like Yeshua is our high priest. Well, how do we know what he did if we don't know the functions and the role of the priesthood? So we've got a few things to learn and get into. Now, one of the first things we're going to notice as we go through this Parsha is uh, the, the scripture reference breakdowns. Okay, They're a little different because of the, uh, the reckoning of whichever translation you're going to use. You know, there's a difference between if you're using a, uh, a King James Bible or... If you're using a, a, a complete Jewish Bible, or if you're using a Jewish publication society, or if you're using a Tanakh, or if you're using uh, ESV, you know, any of these, there, there's uh, differences of breakdowns in the verses in here. Okay, so it, all, the, all the verses are there. They just kind of label them a little different from chapter to chapter. Okay, so when we talk in the first part of this, when we say, okay, we're going to uh, Vayikra, Leviticus, uh, six, two, six, nine, we're actually going back a few verses like Leviticus six, nine would be Leviticus six, two in some translations. Okay. So I don't want that to be a confusing factor. Um, if you're looking up your, if you're looking up your Bibles and you've got it sitting there when you're, when you're watching this and you look, well, that's not what it says. It's there. Okay. <laughs> it's there. So first off, I, I want us to, um, to understand the word tzav is, is this parsha, but tzav is, is command, okay? It's from the word tzava, which means to command. Now, this is also where we get the word mitzvah. You know, mitzvah is a good deed. Uh, mitzvot, plural, good deeds, right? But literally, tzav means to command. Now, why would we start off with this parsha as command? Okay, uh, first off, we notice there's a progression of who who is being talked about, who is being talked to, what the what the orders were. Remember last week, you know, as we opened Vayikra, we learned there are different offerings, different korbanot that were brought by the people, right? And it starts off with, if any man of you brings an offering, right? If, if any of you among you bring an offering, we learn that signifies the person himself, the heart that is bringing the korban, the heart that is bringing the offering, not so much about the offering as it is a means to represent the worshiper to Yahweh. Okay, it is a representation of you, your heart, your attitude, your thankfulness, all of this, right? So here, it's, it's not just so when or if, it's command. So what do we learn about this? Well, who is being commanded? Okay, he always talking to Moshe, and he says, command Aaron and his sons. What we learn from this, okay, we, we talk about this all the time as we go through the Parsha, okay? We, we learn that the closer you get to the tabernacle, the more you have to be aware of the clean and the unclean and the holy and the common. The closer you get to the tabernacle, the more you have to be aware of your surroundings, the more you have to be aware of yourself the more you have to be aware of what is happening so that you can protect the sanctity of the holy things, so that you can keep the holy things holy. And so Aaron and his sons, before they could do one thing on the altar, before they could do one thing, 
in regards to the incense or the menorah or the table of showbread before anything at all. They had to learn how to do it. And it had to be done God's way. It's not like Aaron could come in and say, oh, well, see, Yah says to do it this way, but I think I know I have a better way to do it. I mean, it makes more sense to me if I do it this way. It doesn't work. Okay. Yahweh gave instructions on how he was to be worshipped, how he was to be approached, how they were to come before him, and what was to be done specifically with the different offerings. There were specific things that had to happen. So Aaron and his sons were commanded how to handle the things that were brought to them. Okay? They couldn't deviate. I mean, this, this was uh, not a suggestion. Okay? And, and again, this kind of teaches us that something that goes against uh, our society at large today. You know, when we come in, we want to worship Yahweh and say, oh, we just want to do whatever and anything goes, whatever makes me feel good, whatever makes me feel be careful with that. Now, granted, when we come into the presence of Yahweh, you're going to feel good, okay? You're, you're, you're going to, uh, uh, to be different. You're going to be changed. There, there are things that are going to happen in you. But if that's all we're doing when we approach him, if that's how we, for lack of a better term, if that's how we judge if we've been in the presence of Yahweh is I, I felt good and I got goosebumps, be careful, okay? Because you're, um, you're putting these conditions on Yahweh and it might not always be there, okay? So Yahweh is saying specifically it, not to go by what you're feeling, to go by what he says. Now the result, yeah, you're going to feel something, Okay, I mean, not not the same thing every time. Okay, but it's going to change you, and things are going to happen. All right. So again, the closer you get to the holy things, the more you have to be aware that we are not bringing defilement to the holy things. What that means is not that well, if there's something here, well, I've got to be perfect before I can come before God. That's not it at all. What it is is acknowledging those areas where we're not, and then He'll meet us there. And we can come to him and come into his presence. Okay, so again, it just comes down to being honest and just having that heart open before him. And uh, if there are things that need to change, then okay, let's change them, you know, and, and let's continue to come before him. All right, so back to this Parsha. So we have a progression here, things that are happening. Speak unto the children of Israel, but then command Aaron and his sons. If we jump to uh, Leviticus 10 3 which is next week's parsha but if we jump to leviticus 10 3 it says i will be sanctified in them that come nigh me and before all the people i will be glorified luke 12 48 says unto whomever much is given of him shall much be required and to whom men have committed much of him they will ask more what we learn here is that uh, there's responsibility and accountability in coming into the presence of yahweh Okay, uh, especially when we're looking at Leviticus 10, because that's right after Nadav and Avihu tried to come before Yahweh. They presented strange fire, and there's a lot of different things in that, but it says they presented strange fire. They, they brought strange fire before Yahweh, and they paid a hefty price for that. And what Yahweh is saying is that the, for those who come near to him, he will be sanctified. In other words, people are looking at you and they're going to know the God you serve by how you treat him. So again, it's a, it's a matter of being careful with how we live our life, all right? Well, let's take a closer look at this. So when it says, command Aaron and his sons, saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering. Why is it called a burnt offering? The burnt offering is Ola offering, right? It's the, the offering that goes up. So why is it a burnt offering? It says, because of the burning upon the altar all night, unto the morning and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it really cool thing we see here when we look at the hebrew okay because it says al mokda al hamzbeach kol halila ad haboker so the the word there that you're going to see you've got an arrow here that letter it's pointing at in mokda there's a small mem there in mokda now, mem by itself can represent uh, waves of water. It can represent liquid, water, sea, uh, mighty, massive. Uh, it can represent chaos, like the storms of the sea or like chaos that, it, that is coming in there. So interesting because when it says, so 
we're to keep this fire burning where this Ola offering goes up in the presence of Yahweh and it's to be there all night. You know, in the in the morning when they brought the offerings to Yahweh, there was one offering that was put on the Tamid offerings. There was one in the morning and there was one at the close of all the other offerings. So the first in the morning was a national offering, so to speak. OK, and then all the individual people brought their offerings and the one at night was, again, an offering for the nation of Israel. And it burned all night long upon the altar, reduced to ash. Okay, so but here it's interesting because mokda is a word that's used there in the small mem. So what would a small mem represent based on uh, what a mem itself represents? Look at it this way: if we keep our fire lit and on the altar, our chaos will be small. Mokda is also uh, the root from the word kada, which means to bow or obeisance. In other words, if we humble and submit ourselves to Yahweh, our chaos will be small. Now, what we learn here is that it doesn't mean there is a removal of opposition. It doesn't mean you're not going to go through anything. It doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems. What it means is a removal of chaos. You will have a presence of peace. Okay, and, and that means as we present ourselves to him, and keep the fire burning, the chaos will be small. We will learn to have peace, okay? As we're walking with the Prince of Peace, right? As we come before him and we're in his presence, we have peace. There is peace, there is love, there is joy. All of this in the presence of Yahweh, okay? He never said that it's going to be easy, but he said you can have peace, even in, in the midst of a storm. Yeah, sometimes the, he'll cause the storms to stop, but sometimes he won't. We've got to learn to have peace no matter the situation, right? So we learn there must be a continual fire. And there's a couple of things we see in regards to continual fire. One, there's to be a continual fire on the altar, and there's to be a continual fire in the menorah. Now, on the altar in Leviticus 6, 12 and 13, it says, The fire on the altar will be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall arrange the burnt offering on it, and shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings, and fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually, it shall not go out. So again, the importance is the, the fire that was on the altar was to stay lit all the time. And as we read, when the altar was built, and as they were getting ready to uh, dedicate it, and everything was, was being put into place, Yahweh lit the altar. So that fire that, that is to be kept burning is that fire that originated with Yahweh. You know, what does fire give? Fire gives heat, but fire gives light, right? And fire also burns out the impurities. Fire also purifies. Fire also helps to give life because uh, it, it can cook the food we need, right? So all of this we're learning. We've got to keep that fire lit. We have to keep that fire burning, and it's our responsibility to do that. Next is the menorah. The, the fire in the menorah, which is in the holy place, was to be kept burning all the time and continually. Even when they changed the, the, the cups, when they cleaned the cups, changed the oil, changed the wicks, they were to keep them burning. You know, they would, they would do them one at a time. And they would keep the fire on the menorah burning. In the menorah, it's Exodus 27, 20. It says, You shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light, that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn in the tent of meeting outside the veil that is before the testimony. And Aaron and his sons shall tend it from the evening to the morning before Yahweh, and it shall be a statute forever to be observed throughout the generations by the people of Israel. So we learn that this fire is to be kept burning, and we do have responsibility. We do have a role to play in keeping that fire burning. It originated with Yahweh. He gives it to us, but we have to tend it, all right? We see that because he says, to which the fire has reduced, to the, reduced the burnt offering, he takes up the ashes, cleaning out the ashes. It's the priest's responsibility to clean out the ashes that the fire produces, and what's the ash? The ash was the Ola offering, the offering that was put on the altar, right? Look, look here again. Look, uh, in, in the Hebrew, it's pretty neat because it says, Vaharim et hadeshin, deshin is ashes, asher tochal. That's the word I'm looking at, tochal. I'll tell you what it is in a second. Haish et haola. And it literally can read, and he shall lift up the ash that the fire consumed or ate. 
the Ola offering. So again, this is, this is interesting because the terminology here is that the fire ate the offering. <laughs> now, does God eat? Well, no. Okay. Um, we, we put very anthropomorphic ideas upon Yahweh because that's how we can relate to him. That's how we understand him. But he is beyond it, right? I mean, he doesn't have to eat. But when we come to the altar, it is representative of God's table. So the fire that originated with Yah consumes the offering. In essence, you could say it consumed it like we would consume something. So it consumes the offering. And no, not literally, but, but you get the idea. Okay, the picture is he is receiving it and it originated from him and we are just coming before him, giving back to him. He is completing the process as we come to him. Okay, so moving on to Leviticus 6.13 or 6.6, depending on whatever translation you have. Okay, so it says the fire shall ever be be burning upon the altar. Now, what can we learn from this? If you keep your fire lit, it shall never go out. That's one way to look at it. If you keep your fire lit, it won't go out. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you tend the fire, it won't go out. That's great. Now, tending a fire is be, goes far beyond just lighting it, doesn't it? You got to make sure the wood is in order. You got to make sure that you can get airflow through to get to the fire. You got to make sure that the ash that's there doesn't suffocate the, 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 the wood and, and make sure that air can get through there to keep the fire burning. So there is work to do in tending the fire, just like us in our lives. We've got to make sure we keep the fire burning. Okay. And so there are times and there are things that we've got to make sure the ash is being removed daily. Make sure we get rid of the ash make sure that the wind Ruach, if you will, can blow through and, uh, and, and bring that fire to life to keep it moving, to keep it burning. Right. Okay, another way to look at this is it says the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. Okay, now it says the, the interesting phrase of that at the end is lo tikbe. So you can, this can also be if you do this, if, the, if you keep the fire burning, keep the fire lit on the altar, your negative aspects will be extinguished. If you keep the fire burning, it won't go out. Make sense? But I, this can also be translated as if you, if you keep the fire burning, your negative aspects will be extinguished. So if we get rid of the negative things in our life, we're keeping the fire burning. If we're getting rid of the negative thoughts, getting rid, rid of the negative ideologies, getting rid of those things that are keeping us out of the presence of Yahweh, we're focusing on the wrong things. Turn and learn to, to refocus on Yahweh, his word, his goodness, and the path he has for life for us, and to walk the path that he's setting in front of us day by day, right? So if we do this, our fire will not be extinguished. Do not intentionally put out the fire that he is giving to us. Do not neglect the fire so that it dies. How do we neglect the fire? Well, we don't provide fresh wood. We provide kindling when needed. Properly place the wood so that the air can flow and move the ash away so that it doesn't impede the flame. Again, we have responsibility. You know, whether it be putting on big pieces of wood to keep the fire going, or if the fire kind of today, oh man, we didn't remove all the ash and the fire's starting to suffocate a little bit. We move the ash away and we we're careful so we're not putting the fire out. And now what has to happen is you got to take kindling. And you got to put the kindling in there and you got to get just the right amount of wind blowing in there to, to reignite that flame. That's that's part of our responsibility, guys. Now, Yahweh will help us in that. He'll meet us there in that. But that is part of our responsibility in that. And the beautiful thing about that is that Yahweh has, has provided his people to help us with that. You know, we, we do need to look to one another sometimes to help, okay, to help provide kindling, to help provide the wood, to help uh, remove the ash to help make sure that wind is blowing, you know? If you don't know how to keep a fire going, it's good to ask someone who does, <laughs> okay? So we learn that through the scriptures as well. If we're having a hard time keeping the fire going, we need to look to the people who keep the fire going and ask questions and ask for help, right? Okay, uh, let's keep going. Leviticus 6.18 or 6.11 it says, Every male among the uh, children of Aaron may eat of it as a dew uh, forever throughout your generations from the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy. Now, what we learn is through certain offerings, 
the Levites, Aaron and his sons, and, and, the, and the priesthood received portions of certain offerings, certain portions, that provided for them and their families, because we learned that uh, the Levites had no inheritance in their, in their own. You know, they didn't have any land of their own. So Yahweh provided for the Levites, but he did so by the people bringing their offerings and bringing to the priesthood, and, and they received portions of this so that they could uh, live. And, but what we learn is that not just anyone could eat these things. They, they had to fulfill certain requirements. One of this is that they had to be holy, right? Which again, uh, it was eaten in a holy place, a clean place, and they had to be set apart, which again relates to the idea that the closer you are to the presence of Yahweh, the closer you are to that tabernacle, the more you really have to be aware of how you live your life, how you conduct your affairs. You be careful of the things that are around you and uh, keep the holy things holy, especially if it was put on that altar, right? So another way we can look at this, where it says, whatever touches them shall be holy, um, something we learn. Holiness, unlike impurity, was not considered contagious. So it would be better to translate it this way. Anyone who was to touch these must be in a holy state. See, holiness was not contagious. Holiness is intentional. Now, I said before, you can't make yourself holy, and I still believe that. But Yahweh says, be holy. And then he tells us what, what, in these areas in the scripture where it says, be holy because I am holy. Then he goes on to list things that cause defilement. Okay, so what we're learning is when he says, be holy, he's telling us, I have set you apart. Do not bring defilement. Do not defile yourselves. I have set you apart. Okay, so another way this could be is anyone who is to touch these must be in a holy state. Now, impurity can be around you. And in some cases, believe it or not, can be forced upon you, even accidental. I'm not, I'm not talking about by force. I'm talking about, well, I guess so. But I mean, it can be accidental as well. Here's a couple instances. One, touching a dead body. That made you become unclean. Okay. Now, Again, uh, unclean isn't always sin, but again, holy means to be set apart, right? And we're learning the differences between clean, unclean, holy, and common, things that are set apart. So if we're unclean, then there's a, there was a time that we could not go to the tabernacle until the process was over. So we're learning these things, all right? Be holy is an intentional action to live your life according to the word of Yahweh and according to the heart of Yahweh. You, not you are holy because of what you do, but Yahweh says you are holy, stay that way. Okay, uh, a couple of scriptures here. First, 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. You see that? Touch no unclean thing and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Who's he talking to and where's he quoting from? Isaiah 52, 11. It says, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of Yahweh. Again, what we're learning is that you who bear his presence, you who carry the things where his presence is, you have a higher responsibility to live your life according to his ways. Okay, so it's not like um, well, there is no temple, but don't you know, we are the temple for the Holy Spirit now, so we can live however we want. No, if we are a temple for his presence, if he does reside within us, we should be even more aware of, of uh, how we're living our life and, and how we are being set apart. Okay, you who bear his presence, come out from among them. Live your life to Yahweh. Now, that doesn't mean you go and, and hide away and never see anybody, okay? What it does mean is live your life different. Live your life different. You are to be in his kingdom and be uh, an ambassador for the people of the world. You are to be a light to the nations. You are to be a light to those around you. You can't be a light if you're trying to hide yourself away. That's what Yeshua told us. You don't put a light, you get a light and then hide it somewhere. You get a light, you let it shine, all right? 
So let's keep going. There was a greater responsibility to Aaron and his sons and the Leviim to understand the holy and the clean and the common and the unclean. We see this again in Leviticus 10, verses 10 and 11. When understand this, Yahweh spoke to Aaron directly. Now, most of the time when you see things happening, uh, even at the burning bush, what Yahweh told Moshe was, I will talk to you, you talk to Aaron, right? And then we see this throughout the rest of the Torah. You know, Yahweh spoke to Moshe, Moshe spoke to Aaron, and then Aaron spoke to his sons, and then they spoke to the, the, the Levites, and then they spoke to Israel, all this. It just kind of worked down that way, right? Well, here, Yahweh spoke to Aaron directly. And what did he say to him? He said, you are to put a difference between the holy and the unholy and between the unclean and the clean. And you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Yahweh had spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. Again, they're learning these things so that it can be taught to Israel. You see that? Yes, we all need to know and we all need to study and we all need to learn. But the Levites and Aaron and his sons, it was their place, their responsibility to learn what Yahweh says and to teach it to the people. So what are the people's responsibility in it? To hear, to receive, to shema, to, to understand what is being given to them, right? Uh, let's look at this. Leviticus 20, verse 3. It says, I will set my face against that man. And I will cut him off from among his people because he has given his seed to Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Again, understanding the differences between clean and clean, holy, common. And Yahweh is saying, even no matter who it is, if they uh, give themselves over to idolatry, they are profaning my sanctuary that is in their midst. Why is that a big deal? Because, again, it was to be set apart and to be clean and to be holy. All right. Numbers 1920, the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he has defiled the sanctuary of Yahweh and the water of separation has not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. So again, the idea here is um, if you became unclean, it was your responsibility to go to the priesthood to say, what do I need to do? Right. And, and uh, it was, they, they were to uh, quarantine if need be, and there was a process. Remember the ashes of the red heifer, water purification, declarations of those who were unclean to, to be made clean. All of this was uh, the responsibility of the Levites, not getting into all that. Now we'll cover that a little bit later in the book, all right? But uh, look at Psalm 134. Psalm 134 says, guard the, the offering on the altar, Essentially, this is what is, what is being said, because this was a song of ascent. It says, come and bless Yahweh, all you servants of Yahweh who stand by night in the house of Yahweh. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless Yahweh. May Yahweh bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Now, interesting, because it says he who stand at night, it's ha-omdim, ha-omdim babait Yahweh balailot. Omdim is the word amad, which means to stand. Now, some translations say you who stand or you who serve or worship, all that. But the idea here is the offering that is put on all night long. When, and, it's, uh, and there are those who are standing there tending that offering. And again, standing guard, watching over it, even in the dark of night, letting that just going up into the presence of Yahweh, knowing that it's there. And uh, there, there's some assurance there. There's some assurity there. We have a responsibility to stand guard, is the idea. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, the idea here is we need to keep a perpetual offering ascending, much like it was among Israel, where it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. So what is this? Again, omdim, standing, and relating to the Amidah as well. Ephesians 6.13 says, Because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim so that you will have the power to withstand in the wicked, and, uh, and having done all, stand. So again, the idea is stand, um, you know, in Ephesians, it's not just like, so stand and take your beating. No, it's, it's stand and pray. 
stand and consider that, uh, that uh, altar that is before you, that, the offering that is going up before Yahweh all night. Know the one that goes before you. Know the one that you are worshiping. Stand in his strength and stand in him. This is what we're looking toward, right? So my question here is, so we're talking about the offerings. We're, com- we're talking about uh, coming before Yahweh. Is the, our intent of how we present ourselves to Yahweh important? Because remember, the idea here of bringing the offering was that, so the people bring the offerings, is that all they had to do is bring the offering? No. If their heart was wrong, the offering was nullified. So again, it's not just bringing the offerings that was important. The people they had to have the right heart, then bring the offering for whatever they were bringing it for. I mean, an example, if it was a, a sin offering, they had to make confession of why they were bringing it. They had to repent. And, and then uh, then bring the, bring the offering. If they were bringing a Thanksgiving offering, well, they had to have thanks in their heart. They had to have joy, right? So again, um, it was not just about the offering. It was about how you brought it. And how you present yourself to Yahweh is important. If you're coming before him and you're saying one thing and doing another, you're being double-minded, right? We see examples of this like in uh, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 7, says, Watch your step when you go to the house of God. Offering to listen is better than fools offering sacrifices, because they don't discern whether or not they're doing evil. Don't speak impulsively. Don't be in a hurry to give voice to your words before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Nightmares come from worrying too much, and a fool when he speaks chatters too much. If you make a vow to God, don't delay in discharging it, for God takes no pleasure in fools. So discharge your vow. That means perform your vow. Do your service. Verse 5, better not to make a vow than to make a vow and not discharge it. Don't let your words make you guilty, and don't tell the temple official that you made a vow by mistake. Why give God reason to be angry at what you say and destroy what you have accomplished? For this is what happens when there are too many dreams, aimless activities, and words. Instead, just fear God. That's the idea, isn't it? I mean, all these offerings that were were told that the people brought, these were not all required offerings. Okay, most of the offerings were, if you could say optional, they didn't have to bring them. Okay? The only uh, offerings that were mandatory were the sin offerings. Other than that, you didn't have to bring a Thanksgiving offering. You didn't have to bring a vow uh, to do a vow with an offering. You didn't have to do any of this. But what the Torah says is if you do, this is how you do it. Okay? And so we need to understand when we come before Yahweh, it is important that we're, that we're honest, that we're open, and that we do present our heart to Him, that we give thanks to Him not grudgingly, but we do present ourselves wholeheartedly to him. It is important. You can't just say, uh, well, I can do whatever I want, and God knows my heart. Consider in Psalm chapter 10, verse 13, it says, Why does the wicked despise God and say in his heart, it won't be held against me? Again, you can't just do whatever you want and say, oh, me and God, we got an understanding, right? It doesn't work that way. So we have to learn how to come before him. And ultimately, what it really comes down to is just fear God. Just revere him. Just honor him. We'll learn the rest along the way. If our heart is right before him, then we're going to want to do what he says. We're going to want to listen to his voice. We're going to want to follow after him. And we will learn how to do that as we go through life, day by day by day by day, right? Uh, Ezekiel 18 verses 21 to 32 says this. So if the wicked person repents of all the sins he committed, and then it says, keeps my laws and does what is lawful and right, then he will certainly live. He will not die. Notice repentance, then keep his Torah. Repentance, then walk in his ways. Again, we, we got to understand the Torah was given to show us the ways of Yahweh after we are, are people redeemed. And so we've got to learn how to do it that way. Verse 22. None of the transgressions he has committed will be remembered against him. For the righteousness that he has done, 
he will live. What was the righteousness he has done? He repented, now walks in his ways. Verse 23, do I take any pleasure at all in having the wicked person die as, as Adonai Elohim? Wouldn't I prefer that he turn from his ways and live? Verse 24, on the other hand, when the righteous person turns away from his righteousness and commits wickedness by acting in accordance with all the disgusting practices that the wicked person does, will he live? None of the righteous deeds he has done will be remembered for the trespasses and sins he has committed, he will die. So now you say, Adonai's way isn't fair. Listen, house of Israel, is it my way that is unfair or are your ways that are unfair? When the righteous person turns away from his righteousness and commits wickedness, he'll, he will die for it. For the wickedness he commits, he will die. Verse 27. And when the wicked person turns away from all the wickedness that he has committed and does what is lawful and right, he will save his life. Because he thinks it over and he repents of all the transgressions he committed, he will certainly live, not die. Yet the house of Israel says, Adonai's way isn't fair. House of Israel, is it my ways that are unfair or your ways that are unfair? Therefore, house of Israel, I will judge each of you according to his ways, says Adonai Elohim. Repent and turn yourselves away from all your transgressions so that they will not be a stumbling block that brings guilt to you. Verse 31. Throw far away from yourselves all your crimes that you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? I take no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, says Adonai Elohim. So turn yourselves around and live. Don't just live your life, however, and say, you know, well, God knows my heart. That's part of the problem. If we're saying that as an excuse to get away with things that we know better or to say, yeah, God said this, but he knows my heart. What we're really saying is it doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to do whatever I want and it doesn't matter. OK, because you say, well, God knows my heart. He does know your heart and he knows that you're just making an excuse to not listen to his voice. You want to just do your own thing anyway right? Consider in the book of Revelation, uh, in the letters to the, to the churches, what is said? Does it say, I know your heart? Not once. It says, I know your ways. You know, in chapters two and three to the, to the different churches, it says, I know your ways. I know your deeds. I know your actions. Not, I know your heart. I know what you're doing because our, our actions is an extension and an overflow of our heart. In uh, Revelation three fifteen and 19, it says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. To whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. So be zealous, therefore, and repent. Our, to, be, to be zealous for Yahweh would bring us to a place of repentance. Okay? Now, consider this. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 14. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Yeshua the Messiah. Some will use gold, silver, or precious stones in the building on this foundation, while others will use wood, grass, or straw. But each one's work will be shown of what it is, and the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If the work someone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive the reward. Understand, we started this off with keep the fire burning. Keep that fire burning and the chaos will be small. As we're going through life, as we're going through things, keep that fire burning and uh, we can go through the turmoil and, it, and it, we won't have the same effect on us as it does the rest of the world around us. And then Hebrews 12, verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. What is that acceptable worship? What is this reverence? We are coming before him. We are laying our lives down. Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? A living sacrifice. We're putting ourselves on that altar. We're keeping that fire that is him, that originated with him. We're keeping that fire burning within us, burning out the dross, burning out the things that don't belong there, being refined and being brought into his presence. All got to do with approaching that altar and letting that fire burn. I pray 
that uh, it, it, as we continue through the book of Vayikra and beyond, that uh, this fire in your life that he started, remember that which he started, he will finish. The work that he has started in you, let him finish it uh, and, and continue to get that wood in there, to continue to read, to study, pour out your heart before the Father, continue to do this, let the wind blow, put the fire in order, and and, and let, let it all be consumed before you so that you can be what the Father has called you to be, ultimately in his presence and wholeheartedly his, all right? So uh, again, I pray that these uh, teachings, that, that they challenge you, that they encourage you, and uh, until next time, shalom.